So, um, well, I think uh, one or, or possibly both of the speakers tonight may be well known to both of you. Um, but first of all, next to me here is Professor Arthur Stockwin, uh, who is an Emeritus Fellow at St Anthony's College, Oxford, and also of the Nissan Institute, um, and was previously head of the Nissan Institute at Oxford University. Um, numerous publications, but his uh, speciality uh, is Japanese politics. And Dr. Kweku Ampia, who um, I believe is, you know, was also at Oxford um, with Arthur at one point, but is now um, a lecturer at Leeds uh, in Japanese studies. And Kweku has published particularly on Japan's relations with Africa, um, but he covers more broadly um, diplomacy in post-war Japan and international relations, international political economy. So on that note, I'll pass straight over to both of you. Well, thank you very much, Jason. Um, this is the book, Rethinking Japan, can you say? The Politics of Contested Nationalism. So uh, we'll leave that there. I'm sorry we haven't got copies of it, but never mind. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Good. Well, I want to, uh, what we're going to do is, I'm going to speak first, and uh, I'll, I'll go through it fairly quickly because um, we, haven't, we have limited time. And, and then um, Kweku will, will follow on because we, it's a joint publication and um, I'm primarily responsible for certain chapters and Kweku is primarily responsible for others, although we, uh, there, there's some cross-fertilization as well. The origins of this project, the project that emerged as this book, date from the early months of the Democratic Party, DPJ government, uh, in 2009 and 2010, when for the first time since 1955, the principal party of opposition had defeated the, quote, ruling party, the LDP, the Liberal Democratic Party, and the prospects for more liberal and welfare-oriented politics in Japan seemed real. That government, however, was a disappointment and ultimately failed, being replaced in December 2012 by a government of the nationalist right led by the present Prime Minister, Mr. Abe Shinzo, uh, grandson of Mr. Kishi Nobusuke, Japan's right-wing Prime Minister of the late 1950s. Now, we in this book maintain that the Abe government, in office since na up till now, since 2012, represents a new type of political system for Japan. And we call this the 2012 political system in contrast to um, a, a, a term which is very widespread, the 1955 political system that prevailed for many years. We have thus written a very different book uh, from the account of a liberal political shift that we were envisaging at the start of this decade. We also believe that this revolution revolution may be too strong a term perhaps, but this revolution, I'm going to use that word, has been coming in Japan for a long time and stems in great part from certain developments in the 1990s. How far it parallels uh, comparable developments in Europe and the US is of course an intriguing uh, but difficult question to answer. Now, um, one point I, I need to make, I think, is that uh, this is a fast-changing scene uh, and a number of things have happened since we finished writing the book. We actually delivered the book to the publisher, American publisher, uh, Little um, uh, Roman and Littlefield, in mid-October last year. Uh, and the book came out in record speed at the end of February this year. So, but, of course, uh, the Trump phenomenon had not emerged um, when we uh, delivered the manuscript. Various other things had not happened. Uh, and, and so, to some extent, even a new book is very quickly dated, but still, I think what we are actually arguing uh, is, is still pretty valid. So what are the basic differences between the 1955 political system and what we are calling the 2012 political system? Uh, this the 2012 system is a term not only meant to encapsulate what the Abe government is all about, but also to suggest that it is not simply the product of Mr. Abe and his followers, 
but stems from changes that have been taking place over a much longer time scale. I will also touch on the transition period between the two systems uh, from the 1990s to the 2010s. I believe that the 1955 political system had the following basic characteristics. I'm sorry this is a bit technical, but it's important to understand the difference. Number one, a democratic constitution broadly based on the British model, though it later departed from certain aspects of the British model. Second, a long-term imbalance between the LDP, uh, normally in power, and opposition parties that were almost never in power, but enjoyed sufficient parliamentary strength to block constitutional revision, and, and sometimes to block other things as well. And the concept of alternation in power, uh, which is so fundamental a part of the British system, was absent in practice in Japan, almost absent in practice. Third, an entrenched system of factions, of habatsu, uh, within the LDP, leading to pluralistic policy advocacy within that party. Number four, a powerful, if institutionally divided, government bureaucracy, interacting closely with LDP politicians and leading interest group uh, representatives, particularly big business groups, very, very strong within the LDP governments over the years. Fifth, a system of what were termed policy tribes, uh, the Japanese word is zoku, uh, linking in elements of the public service, the LDP, and leading interest groups in relation to specific policy areas, you know, education, defense, uh, transport, and so on. Number six, relatively weak, relatively weak, remember that, relatively weak central political leadership frequent changes of Prime Minister, limited Prime Ministerial authority, decisions by Prime Minister needing endorsement by LDP committees, cabinet positions allocated on the basis of seniority and factional affiliation, cabinet often acting as a rubber stamp for bureaucratic decisions. And that obviously is pretty different from the British system. Seventh and last, defence policies Influenced by the peace constitution, Article 9 of the present constitution, which started off in 1947, and therefore re restricting the role of the self defense forces, the GHI, essentially to defense of Japanese territory. Although from 1992, uh, the SDF, the self defense forces, also participated in UN peacekeeping missions. They did not before that, but, but uh, the self-defense forces were and are closely integrated with U.S. armed forces under the Japan-U.S. Mutual Security Treaty. Very briefly now the transitional period between this system and the present system as we see it. The transitional system uh, involved the following principal elements. First, from around 1992, the party system, uh, which had been very stable uh, since the 1950s, uh, became very fluid. The LDP was out of power um, between August 93 and June 94, replaced by a shaky coalition of formerly opposition parties. And then the LDP was back in power in coalition with the Japan Socialist Party, its ancient enemy, and under a socialist prime minister, Mr. Murayama Tomiichi, uh, from June 1994 to January 1996. That was uh, a sort of unheard of coalition between the extremes. Secondly, in 1994, a radical reform of the lower house electoral system took place, replacing multi-member districts, which had been a key factor reinforcing factionalism within the LDP, with single member districts, uh, for the most part, plus a minority of seats elected in regional blocks by proportional representation. And, and uh, that compromised the, the, the existence or the introduction of proportional representation seats was essentially designed to make it possible for minor parties to get a certain amount of representation within Parliament. Number three, for, the most, for most of the 1990s, the party system was most unstable. But by the end of the decade, that decade, it had more or less settled down as the LDP resumed its position as ruling party, but now 
uh, with coalition party uh, coalition partners among the minor parties, and a major new party of opposition had emerged, the Democratic Party, the Minstrel, uh, straddling the centre ground of politics. Number four, early in 2001, legislation came into effect, it had been in the pipeline for quite a long time, strengthening the power of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. Number five, a very important figure, Mr. Koizumi Junichiro, Prime Minister from April 2001 to September 2006, actively promoted uh, pretty radical neoliberal policies including postal services privatisation, and he was largely successful in restoring to health the banking system, which had been badly damaged by an overhang of unrepayable loans from the collapse of the asset bubble uh, in the early 1990s. Largely as a result of the reformed lower house electoral system uh, that had eroded the rationale for divisive factionalism within the LDP. Koizumi, remarkable politician by the way, Koizumi was able now to construct his cabinets on the basis of merit uh, rather than having his hands tied by demands from the previous factions. And it's interesting to note that I think uh, since 1945 in this country, uh, maybe one or two out here, um, there have been, I think it's 13 prime ministers in Japan, there have been 34 or 35 by now since, 94, since 1955, actually. Uh, no, since 1945. And, and that symbolizes, really, the fact that um, prime ministers come and go in Japan. Uh, a few have sp been there for a long time, and Mr. Abe is one example, a uh, remarkable example. But uh, basically, the um, difference between the British and the uh, Japanese systems in terms of the tenure of the Prime Minister is very sharp uh, and very contrasting uh, for reasons which I've mentioned. And then number six, uh, three Prime Ministers in quick succession followed Koizumi, the first being Mr. Abe Shinzo in his first administration, but he la barely lasted a year and resigned on health grounds in September 2007. During his brief time in office, he shifted policy emphasis away from Koizumi's uh, concern to liberalize the economy towards a political program of constitutional reform, quote, patriotic education and military upgrading. Both men were right-wing, certainly, but their pr primary concerns are very different. After Mr. Abe stepped down in 2007, parliamentary business became part paralyzed by the first episode of what was called a twisted diet, twisted parliament, nejire uh, kokkai in Japanese, uh, whereby the upper house, house of councillors, could and frequently did exercise a veto of a legislation coming to it from the lower house, because the two houses had a different majority, different party majorities. Reflecting on the political shambles this caused, uh, because a lot of legislation just couldn't get through parliament, and smarting under the adverse social effects of neoliberal policies from the Koizumi era, the electorate in August 2009 voted overwhelmingly on the 30th of that month to replace the LDP with a new government based on the Democratic Party, the DPJ. Uh, and that party was in power from uh, September 2009 until it was defeated, indeed routed, uh, in December of 2012 and replaced by Mr. Abe's government when the LDP returned to power. I, I shall, I'm not going to talk about the DPJ government, uh, except to note that for most of its existence it had to face a second episode of a twisted diet, but the other way around, this time in reverse, and that the LDP exercised to the full the damage it could do to the new government by exploiting this advantage. Despite some successes, that government's uh, performance was unimpressive, I could use stronger terms, uh, and its route in the December 2012 elections was a foregone conclusion. But let us not forget that, of course, that government had to deal with the consequences of the uh, great um, Eastern Japan earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear meltdown in Fukushima, uh, and 
that was one of the blows it suffered, but uh, it really imploded as well. Our contention is that what we're calling the 2012 political system has been long in the making and represents the culmination of developments that go back many years, though the path that eventually led to the present outcome has had many twists and turns, reversals and setbacks before arriving at its consummation under the leadership of Mr. Abe Shinzo, the present Prime Minister. Mr. Abe revered his grandfather, Mr. Kishi Nobusuke, and we may speculate that if Kishi had succeeded in dominating the pop politics of the 1960s, instead, instead of having to resign following the security treaty revision crisis of that year, the, 212, the 2012 political system might have been put in place many years earlier than it eventually was. Japan would have been a very different place if that had occurred. So, what are the salient features of the 2012 system? Again, I'm going to do the numbers. Since the inauguration of the second Abe administration in <coughs> December 2012, the previously powerful factions within the LDP have shown little ability or inclination to challenge the Abe line or his dominance over policy decision-making. It's worth remembering that up to the 1990s, a faction leader such as Mr. Miyazawa Kiichi, yeah, Miyazawa, who was both a talented economist and a liberal in foreign policy, was a powerful countervailing force within the LDP to its right wing. And Mr. Miyazawa favoured the constitution. He didn't oppose it, despite the party position on the matter. When in 2012 the LDP politician Ms. Noda Seiko tried to put herself forward as an alternative candidate in an election for the LDP presidency, she was unable to find enough sponsors to back her cause, and there were no other candidates except Mr. Abe. <coughs> second, during his second administration from 2012, Mr. Abe has demonstrated impressive leadership ability, in contrast to his obviously poor performance when he was in power 2007-2008. Uh, and it might be a very interesting topic for a doctoral thesis to explore how Mr. Abe managed to reinvent himself as a credible leader between September 2008 and December 2012. My own hunch is that the terms Nippon Kaigi and Shinto Seiji Remmei would figure prominently in such a thesis. Nippon Kaigi means Japan Association, as a very right-wing pressure group, and Shinto Seiji Remmei is the Shinto Political Alliance, which also um, veers very far to the right. Uh, I think those names would figure prominently in such a thesis. In other words, uh, if that is a student's hypothesis, uh, it's all about organization plus ideology. Now, th number three, whereas during his first administration, Mr. Abe was inclined to neglect economic policy in favor of political initiatives, he now realized that without <coughs> credible economic policy, he was unlikely to retain electoral support. Therefore, right from the campaign preceding his second administration, he proclaimed a set of economic policies that came to be known as Abenomics. Uh, and it is uh, Dr. Ampere who has written on this uh, in our book. How far Abenomics has been a success is something that I know Kweku wants to explore later in the seminar. Fourth and finally, a, a central ideological ambition of Mr. Abe is to revise the 1947 constitution brought in during the Allied occupation. In his view, and that is his supporters, the current constitution never revised, not a single comma or full stop has been changed in it since 1947. It's one of the, uh, it's now one of the oldest, uh, certainly the, probably the oldest unrevised constitutions in the world, by the way. Um, uh, this, um, the idea of uh, Mr. Abe and his supporters is that this constitution represents American rather than Japanese priorities, places serious obstacles in the way of formulating a made in Tokyo defense policy, and takes democracy too far, in particular by privileging human rights over citizens' duties, as the Meiji constitution did emphasize citizens' duties, or rather subjects' duties in that case. Because of the technical difficulties of revising the constitution, which is imposed by the revision clause, Article 96, uh, Mr. Abe has taken the path of constitutional reinterpretation 
has seen the passage of legislation permitting collective defence. Whereas the established interpretation of Article 9 had been that self-defence was only permitted for the defence of Japanese territory, uh, the new legislation permits joint action with American or other armed forces away from Japanese territory and not in defence of Japanese territory. This is a major change in constitutional interpretation. He finds it difficult to revise the constitution, so he goes for reinterpreting it. Uh, but it is, of course, short of revision, though revision remains the aim. Now, I just, <coughs> I just want to touch on two... Um, policy areas that we uh, devote chapters to in the book. The first one is the designated secrets law and uh, the implications of it for freedom of speech. In December 2013, the National Diet, the Parliament, passed the designated secrets law in Japanese, Tokute Himitsuho, designed to strengthen protection of state secrets. It aroused a storm of criticism and was criticised essentially on four grounds. Although, incidentally, the Americans have been very much pressing for this, claiming that uh, the Japanese system leaked like a sieve and probably did some extent. The first was that a designated state secret, in quotes, was inadequately defined. The second, that the mechanism for overseeing the law was insufficient. The third, that punishments for violators of the uh, law, especially journalists, were draconian, very severe, and fourthly, that some state secrets need not be revealed for 60 years. 60 years is 30 years in the UK. In the book, I discuss my correspondence uh, with a high-profile specialist on the secrecy law, Professor Kimura Sota, broadly a defender of the law, though interestingly enough, uh, he is very strongly opposed to Mr. Abe, and in correspondence he, he, he used the word dangerous, I think, in relation to Mr. Abe, but he still supports the, the, the law, which is a very interesting position to take. But here I want to concentrate on government attempts to limit press freedom that were linked with the passage of the law, though ranging far more widely in their scope. The following story uh, gives something of the atmosphere created. In 2014, the New York Times and the Washington Post cited um, Professor Nakano Koichi of Sofia University in Tokyo. And I should just mention that he's a former student of mine. Uh, in relation to a story about the Yomiuri Shinbun, one of the leading newspapers, rather conservative paper, having to apologize for its use of the term, quote, sex slaves, to describe what in Japan are called comfort women. Uh, which is a translation of Ianfu in Japanese. Both of these newspapers, uh, I mean, I think they thought that comfort women would not be understood in, in, in English-speaking countries, so they, they chose sex slaves, but they had to apologize for this. Both of these newspapers, that's the Washington Post and the um, New York Times, were soon contacted by officials of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs seeking to denigrate the reputation of Professor Nakano and to dissuade him, dissuade them from using him as a source. Now this is where the story gets rather interesting. A journalist from another paper, thus pressured, was a German called uh, Karsten Gernis of the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, a conservative German paper, who before returning home after five years in Japan wrote an article arguing that, and I quote, the Abe government is trying to reverse history and while worsening relations with South Korea, it is contributing to a convergence between South Korea and China. Close quote. Shortly thereafter, the head office of his newspaper in Germany was visited by the Japanese Consul General in Frankfurt, who told its Asia editor that he suspected the purpose of the reporting was for Germis to obtain a Chinese visa and that probably bribery was involved. <laughs> the Asia editor of the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung flatly rejected what he described as an insult to his newspaper, and the Consul General eventually backed down, citing a, quote, misunderstanding. Germis uh, later wrote an article in Number One Shinbun. I'm not sure if anyone knows what that is. It's actually a publication of the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan. 
a wonderful title, number one, Shinbu, mm -hmm. stating that it had become increasingly difficult for journalists to obtain information from, gov from government officials. Quote, yet at the same time, anyone who criticizes the brave new world being called for by the Prime Minister is called a Japan basher. He also noticed, that's close quotes, he also noticed, noted that Japanese journalists were often less able to resist official pressure than foreign correspondents like himself. And then very, very briefly and finally, another issue, the issue, uh, a very complicated issue, the issue of war apology, which has been going on for years, this issue, incidentally. In chapter eight of our book, we look at past war apologies by successive Japanese governments in some detail. With the war apology, this is an apology basically to, to China and Korea, but other countries too, to some extent. Uh, the war apology gold standard, that is our term, uh, being that uttered by Prime Minister Murayama Tomiichi, you remember he's, he was the, social, the one socialist prime minister in recent times, on the 15th of August 1975, the 50th, um, uh, the 50th anniversary of the defeat. Prime Minister Abe made a lengthy and nuanced apology on 15th of August 2016, um, sorry, 25, 2015, the 70th anniversary. But our argument in the chapter is along the following lines. That the Abe government has made war apologies in an effort to satisfy prim principally China and South Korea. But at the same time, their conviction has been continually questioned in concerted campaigns by government supporters to rewrite history, throwing doubt on any justification for apologies, especially on the issues of comfort women and also on the vexed issue of the Nanjing massacre, which is den denied by the far right in Japan. We also quote extracts from, uh, this is a slight different tack, we also quote extracts from President Obama's speech in Hiroshima uh, in May of 2016 speaking passionately about the evils of war, but President Obama stopped short of issuing an apology for the atomic bombing of two Japanese cities. War apologies, perhaps, should go in both directions, though it seems that it is as difficult for US governments to apologize as it is for Japanese ones. Murata Koji, a uh, professor at Doshisha University, reminds us uh, in a publication uh, that he released in 2009 that Prime Minister Abe's grandfather, Kishinobusuke, uh, a towering figure in early post war Japanese politics, Prime Minister of Japan from January 1957 to July 1960 that Prime Minister Kishi had three very determined ambitions. Firstly, he wanted to revise, as a matter of fact, he wanted to scrap the whole of, of the 1947 Constitution, not least because of the constraints that Article 9 of the, of the Constitution imposed on Japan's <coughs> military capability. And, and for our purposes, I've posted the article in question here. I, I like to read this, uh, this, this particular clause. Uh, and it states that the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation, and the threat or use of force as a means of settling international disputes. Paragraph 2 then says that in order to accomplish the aim of the pre uh, preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. It then confirms that the right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. In other words, the international community will not recognize Japan's right uh, of belligerency. Now, Prime Minister Kishi and his right-wing supporters deeply abhorred this particular clause in the Constitution and therefore wanted to get rid of it. Kishi also wanted very much to revise the US-Japan Security Treaty of 1951 uh, because he saw it 
as demeaning to Japan in the way that the treaty arrangements made Japan wholly and hopelessly dependent on, on the United States for its defense. Thirdly, and of course related to the other two ambitions, uh, Kishi wanted to build a strong, a powerful uh, armed forces for Japan because he saw the self-defense forces which was established in 1954 uh, in the context of the Cold War as weak and also as uh, symbolic of the emasculation of Japan by the Allied forces uh, uh, after the war. What we find particularly interesting uh, in regards to these ambi uh, ambitions is that Prime Minister Abe's policies and political rhetoric are very consistent with the ambitions. He very often would say that there is no alternative but to realize these ambitions. But he also knows that in order for these ambitions to succeed, his economic policies, famously known as Abinomics, should also uh, succeed. I suggest that Abinomics, as a matter of fact, is more than just economic policies. Um, it is as much about reviving the uh, stagnating economy of Japan as it is about, as, I, as we argue, about militarizing Japan on the world stage. More immediately, though, I would suggest that Abenomics uh, is designed to erase Japan's traditional pacifist orientation. Uh, the culture of peace, the peace culture that has made Japan so popular uh, in the world, Abe somehow wants to get rid of it at a time when everyone seems to talk about the ideals of soft power. Anyhow, in his attempts to, of course, uh, reinvent Japan in that fashion, he managed to reinterpret, as Arthur noted earlier, Article 9 to allow Japan to engage in collective self-defense. And of course, the idea here is uh, to allow Japan to defend an ally even when Japan itself is not under attack. He talks about this as what he refers to as proactive pacifism, and he contrasts this to what he also calls passive pacifism. And of course, he's talking in this regard about the constraints on Japan's military capability uh, imposed by Article 9 on, on the country. He and his supporters, of course, realized that in order to achieve that ambition of uh, allowing Japan to have the right to collective self-defense, uh, had to initiate certain policies and, of course, institutional reforms. And I want to highlight three of those uh, for our purposes. Firstly, he, uh, and, and of course, the, the coalition government that he had, reformulated the National Security Council in 20, uh, 2013, essentially giving the Prime Minister more powers in regards to issues about about uh, the security of the state. And then, of course, they adopted in 2013 as well the national security strategy. Uh, of course, uh, allowing Japan to identify what its immediate strategic interests were, strengthening and expanding Japan's capabilities and roles in East Asia, of course, and of course, uh, presumably in international affairs. The third point that I want to highlight is what Atta has also already talked about, which is the State Secrecy, uh, Secrecy Act, which was enacted also 
uh, in December 2013. So the government was very busy, you see, trying to create an architecture that would supposedly ensure Japan's uh, strategic interest. Critics of the State Security Act have pointed out that this act is designed to uh, establish Japan as a national security state, empowering the state, as it were, to do as it pleases. And Arthur has spoken quite a bit about that. So uh, I will uh, move on to just point out that, of course, the Prime Minister realizes that there is a correlation, or there should be a correlation, between the economic policies and, of course, his ambition is to make Japan a great nation again. But in one sense, this brings us back to history. Uh, during the Meiji period, the leaders of Japan used to talk about a rich nation and a strong army. And of course, this is exactly what we are seeing. Let me reflect on, just briefly, on the economic content of Abenomics, because I've said earlier that Abenomics is far more than just economic policies. We are always led to the three arrows in Abenomics, starting, of course, with fiscal uh, flexibility, short-term fiscal flexibility, of course, which aims to revive economic growth immediately through increased government consumption and public uh, wax investment. So that in 2013, that is the budget for 2013, uh, Abe introduced $60 billion in public wax, $10 billion more than the previous year's bu budget. And then the second arrow, which is monetary stimulus, designed to facilitate expansionary economic conditions in the short term. Uh, but most pundits, observers of course, emphasize the importance of structural reforms. And of course, the Prime Minister has always also talked about the, the, the importance of his structural reform policies. And this uh, emphasizes a number of, of, of policies, particularly, and I've, I've listed a few here, particularly in regards to uh, regulations or what they call regulatory policies in key areas such as employment, healthcare, and uh, the environment. His, uh, there's also the policy uh, in regards to the promotion of economic partnership uh, to improve Japan's competitive landscape with other countries. And a good example of this would be the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, which somehow uh, Trump has managed to kick into, into the long grass. But, but the point is that Prime Minister Abe invested a lot of time and energy into, into this initiative. And critics, observers have noted that the, the TPP, as they call it, is actually a certain kind of architecture that's designed to contain the hegemonic rise of, of China, because of course China is not part and parcel of that particular initiative. There's also the promotion of industrial renewal, which, which essentially refers to an industrial policy designed to set up an environment that encourages the emergence or the emergence of new companies that would grow through the guidance of the government and the support of the government, of course, so that it will be even more competitive on the international scene. And famously, uh, Prime Minister Abe is very proud of this. He talks about the role of the youth in the new Japan, in the economic resurgence of Japan. And of course, he's also very proud of what he calls womenomics, bringing women into the frame, as it were, to allow Japan to grow. Grammatically, I want to highlight this here. As you can see, the three arrows, starting with uh, Starting, of course, with uh, fiscal policy, and then the aggressive monetary policy, and of, of course, 
the third one that is structural reforms here. And of course, all these three are with feed into the heart of the economy, uh, energizing it in so many different ways to increase, for example, increase corporate uh, contribution to the economic development of, of the country. And we also see that all of that, all of that initiative would police here at the bottom uh, to get away the deflation problems in Japan. What has not happened is that the economic content of economics has not been successful so far. Uh, the target that is the ambitious target for consumer price inflation at 2%, the gross domestic product growth at 2%, and other ambitions have not been realized. The economy, of course, grew uh, by 1.2% in 2015. But then, unfortunately for the Prime Minister, the growth rate was only 0.2% in the fourth quarter, quarter of last year, below the, the market expectations of 0.3%. Uh, His primary problem is that domestic demand remains hopelessly weak. Uh, and, and of course, the, there isn't much that he's able to do about that now. The economic policies have not yielded the expected outcome, in part because, <coughs> as many uh, of his critics would point out, the structural reforms have not been effective enough. The question that I pose here is whether Abenomics has failed. And my response is that, no, it hasn't failed because it's not just simply about the economics. If we are concentrating on the economic content of our economics, then of course there are many signs that it is very much ailing. But the Prime Minister himself talks about the grand vision, <clears throat> the vision to make Japan great again. And I suppose he's pursuing his grandfather's ambitions here to resuscitate Japan and to make Japan the grand country that it should be, as far as he's concerned. I want to just very briefly make a couple of uh, concluding remarks. The 2012 political system that we talk about in the book, to be fair to Prime Minister Abe, is inspired by security problems in East Asia. He's got, of course, this vision that the rise in China is targeting Japan and wants to undermine Japan in so many different ways. And of course, there is uh, the threat from North Korea. So the issue of security problems in East Asia, and of course, uh, the issue of security uh, problems in international politics as a whole is how Prime Minister Abe tends to frame his conception of uh, Japan's problems. And in that regard, he is very determined to grow a big, a massive military capability for Japan. He is pursuing, in that sense, what some people, conservatives that is in the past, uh, refer to as a normal country that Japan should become a normal country, a country that should be able to weigh wars, uh, wage wars any time uh, it was necessary to do so. The problem is that we've been here before. Uh, and perhaps I should also say that history is not a page in a book that you turn over and move on. Uh, history is what remains with us. Our experiences from the past Sometimes it harms us. <coughs> we know that in the latter part of the 19th century, Japan's leaders in the attempt to modernize Japan pursued the same sort of concept 
normalizing Japan, making Japan normal, making Japan to look like the imperial countries of the West so that Japan can engage in territorial ag aggrandizement. Uh, this went on throughout the early part of the 20th century until 1933 when Japan actually left the League of Nations and we know what happened. Our concern, which is carefully art articulated in this book, is that it is very possible with the tensions in East Asia that Prime Minister Abe, perhaps mistakenly, might get Japan, a, lov a lovely country, involved in, in a war situation. And we wouldn't want that to happen. I'll stop here. Thank you.